quite certain, Shannon, that in the um, 40 or so years, 40 plus years of my uh, broadcasting career, I've never opened any program talking about soccer. <laughs> and I bet you a million dollars that I never would. But it's, it's kind of the big international story right now, this idea of the Super League, um, where a bunch of the top teams in Europe, I think a half a dozen of British teams, uh, Premier League teams, um, are looking to get together and play midweek games in some kind of a, a Super League. And the world, the soccer world, is turned upside down by this notion. What's wrong with it? Well, I mean, it's a money grab by the richest teams in the world. That's oh, what it is. Shocking. That, 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 every, every team in every league of professional sport and some amateur sport is about a money grab. Let's get that straight. But, but the interesting thing is that, that this is the one sport, football, this is the one sport that really allows it because you end up playing in, on certain different levels in certain different leagues, whether it's Champions League or, or you end up loaning players to UEFA and the power of FIFA. This is the one league where these types of teams can actually go and under their, their league constitutions, go and do it. You know, you couldn't see this in, in the NBA or the NHL or Major League Baseball or the National Football League. It, it wouldn't be physically possible or legally possible to do it. Soccer is a different world. And the fact that they can do it, if, if FIFA doesn't have enough power to prevent them, is an interesting one. Well, I, I'm not going to pay that close attention to it. I mean, there's one soccer team that, that I am sort of a fan of and that's Tottenham Hotspur and they're included yeah. in this in this group the, the the interesting thing too Bob is there's only 12 right now they're supposed to get to 15 quickly right. and soon be at 20 fascination is there are lots of teams and, and none of them are German too there's so what's going to happen with the with, with, with the Bundesliga the, the the other factor is that you're going to find people criticizing it right now until they get in it <laughs> oh, oh of course <laughs> So does it, that, does it, in your opinion, we've got to be quick here, but does it, in your opinion, diminish the significance of the, of the other things that go, are going on in soccer? I mean, they're, they're playing in their league. They're playing in champions cup. They're playing UEFA cup. They're playing in this, they're playing in that. I don't know enough about it. I can't keep track of it. So, so they're going to play midweek games in this super league. So what? Does it diminish it? Yes, it does. Because we've seen the history of the game that it, things are always d diminished. The FA Cup isn't near what it used to be. It's not as important as it used to be because of all the other things around it. But it's it, in many ways, it's the way the game is go, it, go, going to go, and it's the business of sport, pure and simple. Uh, we all want to see the best against the best, and this uh, purports to um, provide us with a at least a, uh, a partial view of that. Pierre Maguire of NBC um, will join us when uh, we continue with the program after these messages. Well, it should need no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. Uh, Pierre Maguire of uh, NBC is uh, with us. Nice to see you. How are ever how's everything? Everything's great, Bob. Nice to visit with you and John. Been a while since we had a chance to chat. I wanted to start with um, something you made. You made some news this week with a comment you made on air regarding Sidney Crosby, calling him uh, perhaps the most disrespected player in the NHL. Uh, I'm intrigued ab about this on a number of levels, but let me start with this. Disrespected by who, in your opinion? Oh, I think by a lot of different people. And I meant disrespected as a superstar in the league. If you look at the other superstars around all the other sports and the consistency factor that they've had throughout the course of their careers, it's been phenomenal. Sidney Crosby's maybe been one of the most consistent star players, Bob, we've had in the National Hockey League. And he doesn't get nearly enough credit for what he's done for not just hockey, but for the city of Pittsburgh and for the organization, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Disrespected or underappreciated? I think both. I think both. I mean, I've been to cities where I've seen people just absolutely abuse him. Uh, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I've been in other places where he's been underappreciated as well. If you think about what he did for the just the 2010 Olympics alone, John, think about it. That goal, the golden goal. Has he been celebrated nearly enough for that moment in time and in history? I don't think so. Yeah, the, actually, the interesting thing about that, Pierre, is you're probably right. But this goes to a deeper issue that, you know, that we've seen for the last 11 years. 
is that we can't see that golden goal very often. So it's there's a generation now of people that really don't understand the importance of it because they can't watch it. And this goes right back to the whole concept of the NHL and the Olympics and being able to take advantage and use all the great things that happen on the ice at Olympics to help promote the game of hockey. It's a great point. It's absolutely true. But Bob, I will tell you, I've been fortunate enough to coach a lot of really good players and be around them, whether it's Mario Lemieux, Yarmir Yager, Ronnie Francis, I can go down the line. They all got unbelievable accolades over the course of their careers, and justifiably so. Paul Coffey's another one, celebrated all over the place. I don't think Sidney Crosby has been celebrated nearly enough over the course of his career. So why do you think that is the case? Is it something um, about his personality or character? No, I just think he's quiet. You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit about Joe Sackick, if you want to know the truth. Joe Sackick, I don't think, was ever celebrated enough either. And I think they're just professional guys. There's not a scintilla of scandal around either guy. And I think when you look at it, I think that's part of it too. They're almost too good to be true. So what you're saying is he's boring. <laughs> he's just a boring guy from, you know, Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia that goes about his job. I, I I think you know, I've, I've been really fortunate in the last eight or nine years to spend a little bit of time with Sid at, out of a few events. Um, and I'm amazed at how low key he is. I'm amazed how uh, uh, unprotected he is. And everybody just respects him and gives him his space. Uh, and, it, it, you know, there, there, there's a yin and a yang to this beer because uh, the people that stand up and say, hey, look at me, hey, look at me get a lot more attention than the people that don't. And, and Sydney's in that latter category. Uh, and also at a, at a time in his career where his game has morphed again. He's now, in my, my opinion, and you and I, I don't think we've talked about this, but in my opinion, I think Sidney Crosby is the best two-way hockey player in the game. Not, you know, comparable to what Steve Eiserman had to do uh, in the second half of his career in Detroit. Well, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. In fact, uh, I brought that up on our NDC show with John Forslund this past weekend when we were working in Buffalo. I illustrated visually how great he is in the 200-foot game and how great he is in his own zone. Phenomenal. Well, what is shocking to me in retrospect after seeing your comments, um, the and, and we're talking about a level of disrespect and where does it come from, but it's from within the game too. I mean, this guy's got what two heart trophies? Yeah. Um, over 15, 16 years. That seems rather unlikely, doesn't it? Well, there's only two other men in the history of the game that have done something that Sidney Crosby's done. And that's when back to back Con Smite trophies. Bernie Perrant did it with the Philadelphia Flyers in 74, 75. Mario Lemieux did it in the 91 and 92 Penguins. And Sidney Crosby did it with the 2016, 2017. Pittsburgh Penguins three guys in the history of the game have done that and yet we don't talk about this enough very few people even know that and that's a level of excellence that most of us will never witness again I don't think and so uh, again I talked about Sid just because of the respect I have for him as a person and also as a player and I just don't think he gets nearly enough respect around hockey well, when his career is over, and who knows when that will be, it could be soon, it could be not so soon, he will be recognized among the top five players in the history of the game. Is that is that a stretch? I don't think it's a stretch. I, I would hope that he would be. I mean, you've got Gordie Howe, and you've got Wayne Gretzky, and you've got Mario Lemieux, and you've got Bobby Orr, and then where does he fit in? You know, I think you'd have to look at Sidney Crosby being one of the premier players of all time. Biggest problem is they only put four faces on Mount Rushmore. You know, if they had eight faces, you know, we, we might have an easier discussion, but there's only four faces on Mount Rushmore. So, so we, you know, everything's intertwined. There's no question that uh, when Sid retires, and I, I actually, with conditioning now and with the way the game is played and the way he plays the game and he's so smart, he could play a, long, a lot longer than people realize. You know, Pat, Patrick Marlowe, who, who is who is past how now, uh, is 41 years old, 41. Well, that, uh, you know, Sid's 33 or 34. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us. If, what, what if what if what if Sid can play another seven years? 
Oh my goodness. Wouldn't that be spectacular? That would be great for the Pittsburgh Penguins. It would be awesome for the league and it would be spectacular for young hockey fans in particular. Absolutely agree. Uh, I don't know if you can make the argument that Sidney Crosby is the best player in the game today with no disrespect intended. Right. But if not, who is? Who is the best player? uh, Connor McDavid's got to be up there, obviously, Bob. But I think there's a player in Colorado that I'm not sure is getting enough attention. Part of it's because of the way this season is, and that'd be Nathan McKinnon. I watch him on a night-to-night basis when Colorado's playing, and I do a lot of their games. And I think he's the best power player in the game. Doesn't mean he's the best player in the game, but I think he can overwhelm people as well or better than anybody else in the National Hockey League. I think what Connor McDavid and Nathan McKinnon present are unbelievable, difficult challenges for opposition teams. But I think those are probably two of the best players in the league right now. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting to say that because I, I don't think there's any question that McKinnon is the best power forward. And what you're seeing now with McDavid, um, particularly in the last short period of time, the last month, is Connor's becoming more physical. Uh, and w- once McDavid adds the physical nature to his game, th- then he, he, if he can, he, he'll separate himself again with the other players in the National Hockey League. They, that's, that's always been the part that people have questioned. Because remember, Pierre, he, he, he's, he, he's never played in touch and grab hockey in his life. Yeah. He, he's never had to. He, nobody could catch him anyway. But now he's pushing back and he's being more physical. And I think it's actually helping McDavid's game. And I think that he, I think that when you witness what McKinnon has done with his, the McKinnon speed and the McDavid speed are comparable, but the, the body type, the body type forces McKinnon to play a different game than McDavid plays. I would agree. And one other player I'd like to add to that, Bob and John would be Austin Matthews in Toronto. I think that this has been a tremendous season for him and for the Leafs, obviously, but the thing that I think is helping Austin a lot, his reliability defensively is so apparent. Mm-hmm. He forces so many turnovers right now, and that allows he and Mitchell, Mar- Mitchell Marner to get so creative offensively because of the defensive awareness of Austin Matthews. So I think Austin Matthews belongs in that discussion as well in terms of being the best players in the league. Well, again, no disrespect intended. McDavid, though, is a highlight reel um, feature. Um, there's rarely a night goes by where you don't turn on the highlights if you didn't see the games and don't see him do something that is pretty spectacular. In fact, I'm going to say to you two guys, I don't remember a player that has more highlight real goals in his career than this guy already. Although, um, Mario would be maybe second on my list. I'm intrigued by what you think. No, I would agree with that. Um, the thing about Connor, if you go back to what happened the other night with the Montreal Canadiens and him streaking in the third period through the defense of Jeff Petrie and Joel Edmondson, that's insane. Watching him do that at that level of speed and through two pretty stout defenders, that's an unbelievable play. So you're right about highlight reel goals for he. Uh, I broke down a lot of Mario Lemieux's highlight reel goals when I was coaching there. And I got to tell you, Bob, they were spectacular. There were some that were unbelievable, really special. Who else would you be know, on I, that list, guys? I mean, is there somebody else that I'm not thinking of that that had like a yeah, career full yeah, of those? Yeah. Robert yeah. Gordon Orr. Yeah, Bobby Orr. Bob, yeah. Come on. Even at, particularly. Right up there. And, let, and let's let's remember. I, I shudder to think if the if the playing field was level, and what and what I mean by that is the ability for everybody to watch every game. I mean, we watch every game now. We dissect every game now. It's sent to my phone in thirty second bits, fourteen seconds after McDavid makes that great play. I get to see it. Everybody gets to see it. We didn't get to some of the greatest plays that Orr ever made were on film. They were, not every Bruin game was televised. There was no such thing as Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Clubhouse or whatever these the social media platforms are that could help you distribute content. Bobby Orr still, even now, go on the go on YouTube, have a good time, enjoy a couple of hours of of admiring what Orr does. It really is generational, you know. I I, I you know Orr to Gretzky, to Mario, 
to Connor um, and throw a little sit in the middle there between Mario and, and, and Connor. So, uh, cause, the, cause what, what Sid does to me, not to belabor the fact, what Sid does to me is his highlight reel is different. It's a little stick here. It's a back check there. It's a, it's a literally chipping the puck over the guy, over the goaltender's shoulder, as opposed to the other four guys that dominated the game with the puck on their stick for seconds and, you know, 20 seconds at a time. The subtlety of Sidney Crosby's play is phenomenal. Bob, what Bob, uh, John just talked about, I was talking to Scotty Bowman yesterday about Sidney Crosby, and we were talking about ways he manufactures offense. And one of the most creative ways he manufactures offense is off of face-off plays. And he has so many different set face-off plays with his wingers, usually Jake Gensel and Brian Rust. It's unbelievable. It's almost artistic to watch it. It's phenomenal to watch it when you really break it down and compartmentalize it that way in terms of how Crosby does it. So there's a lot of different subtleties to Crosby's games that unless you're watching it all the time, you're not going to appreciate it. So take a minute and try and compare McDavid and Crosby, for example, against players of prior eras in terms of style, um, a comparison based on what you see and how they play the game. Can well, you do I that? Can, I can do Crosby with Peter Forsberg all day long because I was watching Forsberg before he came out of Orange School Vic with Moto because in Pittsburgh we drafted his line mate, um, Marcus Naslin. And so I can tell you that Peter you didn't Forsberg keep him though. Sidney Crosby. Pardon me, John? You didn't keep him though. I wasn't there. <laughs> I was in Hartford then. <laughs> <laughs> and Scotty was in Detroit. So there you go. <laughs> Wasn't our fault. Um, but anyways, I would say Crosby and Peter Forsberg are unbelievably similar body type, how they manufacture offense, face off plays, play the same position. For Connor McDavid, it's hard. It's hard to find a comparison. And, and I would say I'll defer to my friend, John Channon. Guy Lafleur because of the speed, but different because one guy's a centerman and one guy's a winger so completely different but man oh man it's hard to find a comparable for Connor McDavid no there 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 isn't any um because of the speed and and the way his brain works adapting to the game all of the guys that we've talked about are brilliant with their vision brilliant understanding the game Connor is at another level again I think with that, his ability to read the offensive zone. And again, what's coming now is he's playing better defensively. Ex exactly what we saw Sid do in, in his career. We forget Connor McDavid is not 25 yet. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, look at, look, look how, look how Sid, you talked about Forsberg and I it's kind of remarkable at the Forsberg because Peter Forsberg is a much taller person than Sid but he may be in the same width. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> That's the magic of Crosby. Yep. Yeah. And we're, I, I, I mean, we're still waiting for Connor's body type to, to, to grow a little bit more too. There will be more muscle mass in Connor McDavid's career between the ages of 25 and 30. So, and what he will be able to, and if he can be able to maintain the speed and his ability to recognize plays will be totally remarkable. I hearken back to an era of guys like, uh, you mentioned Lafleur, and that's what brought it to mind. Uh, Lafleur, Bobby Hull, of course, um, Frank Mahovlich, you know, down the wing, inside the blue line, fire that shot more as often as not, it goes in. That play has uh, been absent from the National Hockey League for the most part for, what, 20, 30 years. 100%. But what we also know is that in life, um, what's old becomes new again at some point in time. Um, I haven't got a pair of bell-bottom jeans, but I did at one point, and I don't doubt at some point they'll come back. Bob, uh, Bob maybe they did, Bob. and I missed it. What? They're not coming back. Please, well, they, um, and don't even try to suggest it. Nonetheless, can you? Is there ever going to be a time when we see that you know forty-foot slap shot from inside? Guys don't even take slap shots much anymore. No, they don't have time and space to do it. I think it's a foreign concept right now. Part of that is the size of the goalies and the athleticism of the goalies. It's just so hard to beat them from out just on a that straight line play. It's almost impossible because their angle plays so good and they're so big. So I, I don't know if that play comes back or not, but 
I remember being a kid growing up in Montreal, going to the forum and watching Guy Lafleur come down the right side. And man, oh man, it was electrifying. And then when Mike Bossy was playing with Brian Trotcher and Clark Gillies with the New York Islanders, it was the same kind of stuff. They would come to Montreal and I'd watch Mike Bossy come down the right wing and be like, holy mackerel, this guy's unbelievable. But I think that play's kind of gone from the National Hockey League. That's pure and simple, uh, the development of goaltenders and maybe more particular goaltending equipment. Uh, you, you know, you just, you don't see that space. You don't see that top shelf, you know, corner anymore. I mean, it, and, and, and really what, what happened was that I, I think, and I never coached in the NHL, but people learn to adapt and, and rather than use your speed to come down the wing is they decided that it would be easier and better to get the goalie to move side to side, get the goalie yeah. to move side to side. And that, that's why the, that's why the game moved from being a winger's game because it was a winger's game to a center's game and and so the centerman became much more important for the for how the puck moved in the offensive zone as opposed to the wingers doing what you suggested bob because it was you know i mean before before our time it was the rocket it was hull it was how it it was the big wingers that really dominated the game until phil esposito did in the late 60s bob you know what's a cool thing i was at the all-star game a couple years ago in san jose and I was in the dressing room with the goaltenders from the East and Henrik Lundqvist and I were talking and all of a sudden Andre Vasilevsky came into the dressing room and he stripped down into his underwear and he left to go put on his equipment. And Henrik Lundqvist looked at me and goes, I had no idea that guy was that large. He is so big. Bob, I've been in NFL dressing rooms. He's the same size as at most tight ends in the national football league. When you mm -hmm. walk in and you see him, without his equipment on, he is a massive human being. And he's probably the best goalie in the National Hockey League right now. And the amount of space and the athleticism that he has is phenomenal. It really is. Five years ago, one of the major topics of conversation amongst all of us was the size of goaltenders and, the, and, and equipment. And um, with, I think, some reluctance, perhaps, the National Hockey League um, made a few relatively minor changes and limitations on the size of equipment. Is it still too big? I mean, goaltenders are is. bigger than they used to be. I mean, Gump Worsley would not play in the National Hockey League today. And I've seen oh. pictures of Gump Worsley standing in the middle of the net in the at the oh. Montreal Forum, the old half forum. of our audience, half of our audience on the keyboard Googling Gump Worsley. We go. Well, but he was not, I mean, I don't think I don't know whether it was whether he was the smallest, but they were all small. Uh, yeah. Crozier was a little guy. Johnny Bauer wasn't a big guy. Glenn Hall wasn't huge. I mean, you can go on and on and on Jimmy, and on. Jimmy Rutherford. Jimmy Rutherford wasn't Jimmy a big Rutherford. guy either. Look at him. There's another one. Yeah. Mike Palmatier. Well, who was the first big goalie you remember? Ken Dryden. Right. That's what I was going to say. Kenny Dryden. Right. Yeah. And Ken Dryden, by comparison, would be normal today. He, would I, he wouldn't be. be small, but he'd be he'd be uh, normal size. But if you look at Ken Dryden in the equipment that he played in, oh. in the you know seventies, um, there was lots of space, lots of room if you were coming down the wing or in front or anywhere else. So I guess the question becomes: Do you think the NHL should readdress the size of goaltender equipment, and is the notion that they need to be that have that much on? in order to be protected? Well, the protection part is a big question. And I think it's something that the National Hockey League Players Association is trying to address. And I think the league's trying to address. It's an interesting sidebar story that I'd like to share with you. I was with an NA NHL head coach probably around five or six years ago. And what he did is he had his group tape the visiting goalie from behind because they thought the goalie was way too big. And he showed me the tape. And he was spot on. And what it was, was it wasn't his leg pads. It wasn't his upper body. It was his pants. Mm -hmm. His pants flared out outside of his leg pads. So his pants were actually larger than any other part of his equipment. And they would stop a lot of the pucks when he would drop down. His pants would flare out. And so it made him bigger in goal. So it's not an easy task for the league. But I do think at some point they have to find a way to shrink the equipment and still keep the goalie safe. Yeah, and well, I mean, and listen, I think Kay Whitmore uh, has a he's the he's the goaltender guru at the National Hockey League when it comes to equipment. I think Kay Whitmore has had a thankless job yes. uh, because none of us are ever ever like it. 
there have been enough changes that, you know, the goaltenders are not happy, which is a good thing. I think it's good when the goalies aren't happy. Um, but when you can sit and say, hey, listen, it's all about protection first, it's difficult to argue. It, 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 you know, this all, this all started, and maybe it was before this, but because goalies have cheated forever, whether it be fish, fish net and fishing line between their, their arms and their bodies. Uh, Tony Esposito, I, I shudder to think what Tony used to have to make sure the puck just didn't get by him. Uh, John Garrett wore a dress that was, or a uniform that was as long as a dress, so the puck wouldn't go through the five hole. And when he dropped down, it would hit his uniform. But Garth Snow was the guy that changed that all for me. Garth Snow decided that if well, if it's good enough for a lacrosse goalie, it's good enough for me. And he had the giant pads, the giant uh, chest protector. He was six foot four anyway, so he was a big goalie. And and the league at that point still was learning how to police equipment. Uh, and because equipment manufacturers were out of control and they were running the game and not the league running the game or the teams running the game. And, and they've slowly tried to bring it back in, bring it back in. It hasn't necessarily worked all the time, but we're getting there. And, and I think goaltenders, as long as they can use the words protection, 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 it's going to be difficult to get them any smaller than what they have now. No question. I agree. Well, I think, I think that's a con job um, to be, to be blunt with by, you. By the goalies? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, you were um, a goalie. I I was, and I and now that was a couple of years ago. I concede. <laughs> you played. You you were you played major midget against George Vezina, though, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and, and I and I kicked his ass every time we played. And they named a they named a bleeping trophy after him. I yeah, got, there's a I got, there's a, a, I got a cheese sandwich. There's a bunch of kids Googling George Vezina. Now. This is the greatest con jobs in, in the history of con jobs that they needed for protection. You could, you could put um, um, a police vest on the goaltenders and it would take up abs almost no space whatsoever and protect them completely. I played with arm pads that were about a half an inch thick and it was just foam. And if you took a shot on the arm, you got bruised just the same as as if you took a shot when if you didn't have People the equipment. People don't on. want to be bruised anymore, Bob. People don't Honest want to, to be God, bruised. it's just it's it's a con job. It's about guys trying to keep their goals against average down. And the NHL and hockey in general let goaltenders get as big as they want it to be, and now they're trying to rein them back in. That's right. And they're getting conned into the notion that it's all for protection. Poppycock. The equipment manufacturers could pro could produce equipment today that would be half the size and protect them absolutely as well. There you go. There's my speech on that subject. Whoa. You guys can disagree all you want. I don't care. Uh, we got to take a little break here. Uh, we're going to be back. Pierre Maguire is with us. We're talking about the NHL today, not the NHL of the past and equipment changes and that kind of stuff. Who's going to the Stanley Cup final, perhaps? Uh, when we continue after these messages. Yours truly, Bob McCowan, along with uh, John Shannon and our special guest, Pierre Maguire of uh, NBC is with us. You're one of those guys who gets to see a whole bunch of teams live in action. I know John watches games on his multiple screens every night. Too many. I watch too many games. Yeah, and um, there's value in that, but you get to sit in the arena um, in, in many cases. Um, who do you like? Who, who in this era where nobody plays outside their own division, is it impossible to measure to the relative quality of the performances that you are seeing? No, I don't think so. Colorado's for real. Vegas is for real. That's going to be an amazing showdown if they play in the Western Division playoffs. Um, I would say Tampa Bay, Carolina, and Florida are very for real in the central. And that will be very interesting where a lot of people were seeding it to Tampa early on. I think the Florida the Panthers, especially with some of the additions they've made in terms of being a harder team to play against, even though they don't have Aaron Ekblad, I think the Florida Panthers are gonna be a very dangerous team. Carolina is as well coached as any team in the National Hockey League. Rod Brindamore has done an amazing job and they have some real good players. So they're legit. Um, I think it becomes a little bit more difficult with the Canadian division or the Northern division only because of what COVID's done to the division. It's been very difficult to gauge, but clearly Toronto is at the upper echelon of, of that division. It's really apparent to me anyways. 
And in the East, the Washington Capitals are, are really a good team. Boston's starting to surge. But long-term, Bob and John, I think the team that will have to be and really watch will be the New York Rangers. I think long-term, what may not be this year, long-term, the New York Rangers are going to be an amazingly difficult organization to play against. I'm a little surprised you excluded the New York Islanders from that because there's been a lot of praise for the way they have played, and um, Lou's done a good job there. He's done a very good job. The reason why I don't have them with the upper echelon, their power play has been very, very slow and not very good. They don't score as easy as a lot of teams. Um, they have great center ice depth, especially with the acquisition of Travis Ajak right now. If you go one, two, three, four, five, you know, you start with Matt Barzell and then you move to Brock Nelson. Then you go to JG Pajo. Then you go to Casey Sezikis and Travis Ajak, a guy that's played over a thousand games. Their center ice play is great. I just don't know if they're going to score enough. And that's going to be the biggest issue for the Islanders. But they're a team that could cause a lot of problems. There's no question. It's interesting though. Toronto Maple Leafs made a lot of changes at the deadline. They haven't, as we tape this, they haven't won a game uh, yet since the deadline. So only four or five games, that's fine. And neither of the Islanders. The Islanders have not played very well. Uh, and it makes you wonder. Now, the, the, the Leaf additions, they really haven't played yet because of the quarantining um, and a few other issues. But the Islanders, you wonder how long it will take for the chemistry of, a, of two new guys that really got heralded as guys that are going to put them over the top in Palmieri and Zajac. How long will it take for that chemistry to, to be fixed before the playoffs? And that's always the challenge at the deadline, isn't it? hundred percent. I just did the Islanders Flyers game in Philadelphia on Sunday night. It was a one, nothing win for the Islanders, John and uh, Ilya Sorokin played phenomenal in goal for the Islanders. He was really the story of that game. The Flyers deserved a better fate, but yeah. one of the things that was apparent to me, the offensive confidence of the New York Islanders is probably not where it needs to be right now. And so I think that's something that Barry Trotz and his staff will probably try to inject a little more offensive confidence into that team. Defensively, they're fine. They're yeah. very, very stout. But to me, that's one of the things that might hold them back just a little bit in terms of how long it takes to amalgamate those two new players into the team. I would say by the end of this week, they should be ready to go up full speed ahead. Um, there is a belief that you have to go to the dance before you can learn how to dance. Um, and um, you talked about Florida and everybody's been impressed by the way they've played, but they have perilously little um, postseason experience. The Toronto Maple Leafs have enough postseason experience, but they have no postseason success. Do you subscribe to that theory that 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 experience is critical, maybe even vital? It helps, but I'm going to go back into the memory bank. 1990, the Pittsburgh Penguins missed the playoffs on the last day of the regular season. Craig Patrick went out and hired Bob Johnson to be his head coach, Scotty Bowman to be his director of player personnel, Barry Smith as an assistant, and me to come in and join the organization. And what happened was this is a team that missed the playoffs in 1990. In 91, they win the cup. In 92, they win the cup. And in 93, they win the president's trophy. So they didn't have any of that experience from the 90 team, but they had an unbelievably aggressive general manager, a really smart head coach, and then another man who's the winningest coach of all time as part of the organization. So I think a lot of it depends on the managerial philosophy and the type of people you have running your team. Yeah, it, if it, you got it, the it, right people, a, all that experience can go out the window. It's a good point. And when, but when you think that Mario was there, Yager was drafted not long. You know, it, it was, was drafted was, that year, 1990, fifth right, overall. Right. Um, Tom Barrasso really stabilized goaltending in Pittsburgh that was maybe the acquisition that Craig deserves credit for that nobody ever talks about correct um uh, and, and the other team I would look at Bob uh, more recent than that is is Vegas how do you explain what Vegas did then uh in their first year well you know, uh, they went all the way to the Stanley Cup fight. and now a lot of that was goaltending and they ran out of gas but uh, they had depth they 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 played a really really fundamentally strong game. They they weren't very structured. Let's be honest, because that's not the way Gerard plays and coaches when he was coaching. Um, so I, I'm not sure the experience really means as much as everybody 
you know, cracks it up to be. Well, having said that, the Vegas the Vegas team did not win the Stanley Cup. They got they got beat comfortably by Washington in the final. So eventually the magic did wear off. And I always thought that, you know, as great a story as it was, and it was one of the great stories of my lifetime, um, it it was it was a rarity. It was an aberration. It wasn't normal. It didn't really mean anything in the long term. It didn't mean the game was changing. Mm. Um they put together a pretty good hockey club out of nothing, out of, out of dust. Yeah. And they've proven the last couple of years how good that hockey team was. Now, yes, they've made changes. Yes, they've, they've um, made trades and deals and brought in a lot of uh, more skilled players, but they're still good. Pierre listed them at, uh, on his, he put them on, their li- on his list of uh, teams, you know, that re- realistically can win the Stanley Cup this year. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to argue that. You know what's interesting about Vegas? doesn't get talked about nearly enough how George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon orchestrated the expansion draft. Oh, I know what they did to all the other general managers is an unbelievable. If you did that in regular society, you'd go to jail. (laughs) They built for organizations all around the league. They really, what they did to the Minnesota wild. You think about it. It's because Minnesota didn't want to expose one defenseman. They lost Eric Hall and tuck. Alex mm-hmm. Tuck. And look at Tuck. Tuck's on his way to having a 25 goal season this year. That's unbelievable. He would have had a 35 goal season in an 82 regular ga- uh, season game. It's unbelievable what they were able to do against some of these other teams <laughs> during the expansion draft. Bob is criminal, really. Oh, 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 look, I, I, I know we've talked about it uh, endlessly. Um, on wait, this, listen, this wait, listen, wait. Here's the interesting thing about Vegas with this expansion draft. And George, we've had George on to talk about it, right, Bob? Is yeah, they use, don't be lose surprised if no, they they lose nothing. Don't be surprised if they 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 create a little bit of a frenzy around the expansion draft by helping other teams get through the draft. Yeah, I think I think Vegas will I think Vegas will play a role in the expansion draft this summer. I really do. Even Somehow, some way, any, even though they can't lose any players. It's unbelievable. Right. It really right. is. I agree with you. 100%. Agree. Hey, I, I mentioned Gerard Gallant uh, a little earlier. Um, you're, you're closer to the coaching fraternity than, than most. What's the shelf life of an NHL coach now? It depends on how they coach. And it depends. Well, on okay. So, so some guys so, are bombastic. John Tortorella. They're in your face or gruff. They're hard. Three to four years. Some guys are less gruff and they've got better players around them. They can last longer. Joel Quenville can last a long time because he had superstars that believed in him. He supported them. And so his tenure in Chicago was unbelievably long and very fruitful. So it depends on the situation that you're in. Well, I often think that. Um, I don't think he answered my question. I think, question? I think you evaded the question, the, I, I, the shelf life of a coach, because well, he said three it's to four inter- years if you're if you're oh, uh, you know but, if you're no, said demanding three, three to four three to four years but if you got good players you can i mean of course if you got good players you can i mean heck that that's if i had good players i could coach in the national hockey <laughs> well then your question and your initial question is a stupid one then no it's not it's it's one of those ones where you where <coughs> you, you, you look there are some good coaches out of work now and was it because the players got tired. Management got tired. Uh, you know, where there how where there politics. What what goes into what goes into a, a, a guy like 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 Barry Trotz, an amazingly strong career in the game was was in Nashville for seventeen years. Didn't win anything really, but st- stuck it out. I mean, I, I just wonder. I mean, it, it, it's become that that hinge point in every franchise where, well, things are screwed up. We're going to fire the coach. Relationship um, and with it, the manager matters too, John, you know, that yeah. matters too. And he and David Poyle were attached at the hip going back to the yep. days in Washington. So that makes a difference too. Darcy Regeer and yeah. Lindy Ruff and Buffalo best friends. They were in each other's wedding. I mean, that matters a lot. Scotty in Detroit, Scotty in Detroit with Kenny Holland and Jimmy Devilano. They were the ultimate three-headed monster. They all had something at stake in terms of managerial stuff and also coaching. So it depends on the situ- Every situation is different and it's fluid. There's no question. Well, Poyle was never threatened as general manager in Nashville either. So he didn't, you know, he didn't have to 
you know, go down the firing line and find Correct. somebody to get rid of, right? And, th and that happens a lot. Yep, I agree. GM feels threatened. What am I going to do? Well, I'll fire the coach, you know, um, whether he thinks it's the right idea or not. And we all know that it's, that it's happened and, and happened over and over and over again. Poyle was never in that situation. So when all is said and done with this COVID season, now, who's that team that um, skates around the ice with the cup? I'm not prepared to say that, but here's what I would tell you. I wouldn't be surprised to see a Tampa Bay Lightning, Colorado Avalanche Stanley Cup final. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, Tampa, I would say Tampa's route to the final is probably easier than, than Colorado's. Would you agree with that? It is, but you talked about something that I think is really important. The experience factor of Colorado is huge. I've done almost all of their playoff games the last two years. In fact, I think I've done all of their playoff games the last two years. And they experienced a bitter disappointment two years ago against San Jose. They experienced unbelievable disappointment in game seven against Dallas last year. And Yoel Kiviranta, a player that has never been drafted in the National Hockey League, gets a hat trick and beats him in game seven in overtime. Um, so they've got this experience now of hating to lose. They... It's a bitter taste in their mouth, and I expect them to be able to use that as a motivational tool going forward. Well, if they play, if they play Tampa, they'll play a team that has more playoff experience than anybody in the NHL, and a, and a great head coach in John Cooper who knows how to to work that into the uh, into the equation. Very fair, very true. For Colorado, it all comes down to one thing: goalie, goaltending. Yeah, goalie. If, 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 if I mean. Look at look at the revolving door they had in the bubble pier. No, they you had know, tons I mean, of injuries too. No, but, know, that, but, but, but that's part of the game. It is. It's no question. You know, you, you know, how many teams need, lose their top two goalies over the course of a playoff run? Not too many. That's right. Not too I mean, many. I mean, no disrespect and, and so to if, Michael Hutchinson. No disrespect at all. But would you ever see him starting a game seven in a Stanley Cup playoff series? I don't think so. No, no. Well, and that, that, that's when you... I mean, in particular in this COVID year, I mean, goaltending and, and the health of your goaltender is so vitally important uh, for any success. If Philip Grubauer can stay healthy, I think you're right. They're going to be a factor. But it's, you know, the, you know, the longevity, the health of your goalie. I mean, that's one of the magic things about Vasilevsky. Sure, he's missed some games, but overall... Vasilevsky, since he took the number one job, has been pretty healthy. I, I marvel, Bob and John, I marvel. I talked about it before, the size of the man, the flexibility of the man, the quickness of the man, and how resilient the man is. He, he's an amazing athlete. He really is. Well, and go and I'd circle back to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, if Anderson is back in the playoffs, I mean, that's what you would want to see if you're a Maple Leafs fan. But at the same time, you'd be nervous because his playoff performance historically has been mediocre at best. I, 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 in the end, goaltending may be the Leafs' Achilles' heel. It may be their Achilles' heel. By the way, I, 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 there are some wild cards. I know we got to go, but there yeah, are some do. wild cards in the playoffs that need to be mentioned. The Winnipeg Jets are a wild card. The Winnipeg Jets could win it all too. Very I mean, they're fair. a team that could actually win it all. Mm -hmm. And and there and and I would not sell a team that's going to make the playoffs probably with a ton of experience if their goaltending stays and that's the Boston Bruins. And those are yeah. two teams that Peter didn't mention. And that's the wild card thing of this, of, of this 56 game schedule and the way the play, the games are played. Michael, Boston and Winnipeg could be in the Stanley cup final too. Quick I'm here. surprised Winnipeg didn't do more at the trade deadline just to back on John's point. And I'm worried about the Bruins depth on defense. They know Tory crew knows the Dano Charles who knows when Brandon Carlo is coming back. When's Mac Grizzly can be hundred percent. Is Kevin Miller going to be able to last? I, I worry about the Bruins' defensive depth. I really do. Uh, Pierre, good of you to take time for us. It's great to see you. It's been too long. Um, hopefully, we'll get a chance to do it again, um, and it won't take as long for the second. Thanks a lot, Bob. It's been a pleasure being with you and John. Thanks for having me. Pierre McGuire. We'll come back and wrap it after these messages. Bob McCowan, John Shannon, back to wrap it up very uh, quickly. Our thanks again to Pierre McGuire for, uh, for uh, joining us been a long time we used to we used to have a ban um when pierre was you know doing tsn stuff i couldn't talk sure. to him on sportsnet well you know such is life that's one of the great things about the podcast and doing what we do is that we're 
we have access to a lot more people and people are, uh, for some reason, people like going on with you. I don't understand it, but they do. No, neither do I. Um, uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I've never been of the philosophy. I've never understood the philosophy of protecting your talent and not allowing them to come on shows on other, other, other outlets. It, I, it's wow. a stupid, stupid idea. I mean, you probably a, did this when you were at Hockey Night in Canada, but no, it's still no. stupid. It's a very Canadian thing. And the Americans, I mean, even forget non-sports. How many times on, on, on the, that Johnny Carson show did you watch a guy from ABC or CBS walk on to promote his show? It happened all the time. It happens all the time on talk radio in the United States, cross-network promotion to, to get the best people on the air to help promote your sport. I, and I, I, I mean, it, to me, it's cockamamie still. So. When I was at Sportsnet, I was never reluctant to, to have somebody on from TSN and say, hey, they're, they're from TSN. Um, it just got to the point where it never happened. Both, both networks shut down that possibility. We got to go. We're going to shut down this show. But uh, if the crick don't rise, we'll not have another not, not forever. Not forever. Not forever. Just till tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, until then, uh, for John Shannon, Bob McCowan, have a good one.